Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all participants and attendees. And thank you very much for joining us today from different countries for our final on online research activities in the framework of the project GLAM and Digital Soft Power in the post-pandemic world. It's been a great journey to working with so many museum professionals, academics, and policymakers and GLAM representatives to explore emerging ways to enhance, activate, and communicate the value value of cultural assets and heritage collections in the global media environment. And I do believe that our discussion were very instrumental to explore the concept of digital soft power from various perspe perspectives and exposing uh, so far all exciting opportunities and great challenges that glam actors are facing in the global uh, media environment. And today we will deepen our understanding of digital soft power by exploring it through the lenses of digital placemaking, city brand and diplomacy. The webinar today will question such phenomena as digital tourism, digital cultural heritage, and its virtual cultural consumption, and it will investigate the role of digital representations, narratives, and images constructed by uh, different museums and glam institutions and other urban stakeholders, including citizen communities, in the development and circulation of urban identities in the uh, global media space. The webinar will include three important activities, our interactive practitioner panel, interactive data panel, and a discussion forum, each taking no longer than 30-40 minutes, and we will open the session with keynote uh, from Professor of uh, Critical Heritage from the University of Western Australia, Professor Tim Winter, and we will close the webinar with our discussion forum featuring online projects of four museums from different parts of the world that will offer interesting Seeing, uh, illustrations of the digital urban soft power. I would like to welcome all our audiences to use the Q&A function to submit to their questions to our panelists and participants uh, throughout the panels anytime. And our panelists will be happy, I believe, to answer uh, either by typing in their responses or by addressing your issues or questions during the Q&A sessions. So let me now share the floor with our keynote, uh, Professor Tim Winter, Australian Research Council Profes Professorial Future Fellow and Fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. Um, Professor Winter is well known in academia for his foundational research in heritage diplomacy and his project in the past few years focused on the heritage Silk Road diplomacy and address how the historical past comes to be reconstructed for diplomatic, uh, geopolitical and nationalistic purposes. And he is the author of several books on the topic, including Geocultural Power, China Quest to Revive the Silk Roads for the 21st Century, with Chicago University Press from 2019 and the Silk Road Connecting Histories and Future, which I believe is coming uh, right now with Oxford University Press. Uh, and uh, team, welcome to the floor. So you can start your presentation right now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natalia. Thank you very much for the, um, the invitation and, and the generous welcome um, you've given me. I'm going to move quickly because we only have 10 minutes and it's a very packed, interesting schedule and it's a really important topic. So I just don't want to um, delay further conversation. Um, so obviously I'm talking about, uh, as Natalia's indicated, the, the, um, what's happening around China's Belt and Road Initiative, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with that was launched in 2013, a geopolitical, geostrategic concept that runs across multiple sectors. And it's a transcontinental and transoceanic concept. And that's important when we're thinking about the cultural sector and where that's going in the future. And so Belt and Road has been framed and, and uh, positioned as the revival of the Silk Roads for the 21st century, as many of these books that you've seen in recent years appear in bookshops and online uh, are kind of testifying to and what that means in terms of 21st century international affairs. What we've also seen is an ongoing and proliferation of interest around Silk Road histories. Now, that's a concept that was invented in the late 19th century, which I'm sure many of you are aware. But I've spent many hundreds of hours trying to work out what is the Silk Road over the last few years. It's, it's a very, very complicated concept and one that has morphed and evolved over in different ways over the course of the 20th century. And that's what some of those um, 
uh, uh, there's two books that um, Natalia has indicated. Uh, that's at the center of those two books. I'm trying to understand the Silk Road and I've framed it as a geocultural imaginary of the past, a narrative of Eurasian and transoceanic history that has also become associated with ideas of peace, harmony and intercultural dialogue. And it's these values and this narrative of peaceful trade and cultural exchange that China is mobilizing today and it's in its idea of, of reviving the Silk Roads for the 21st century. But what those two books also show is that Belt and Road as a future oriented project and the Silk Road as a narrative of the past are co-producing each other. And that's critical. Um, the Silk Road is not something that's merely being um, that's used and deployed as a, as a history and depiction of the past, it's being uh, uh, transformed and the narrative is evolving spatially, temporally, conceptually, because of the ways in which China now takes this forward in the 21st century. So one of the ways in which we're seeing that is through world heritage. And so the Belt and Road corridors, which you see the developmental corridors you see in this slide, overlay with a number of Silk Road properties as identified by UNESCO and ICOMOS. So when, you, when we do overlay those two slides, what we see is a grand scale of the ways in which we're seeing a political economy of heritage production um, evolving in recent years, and I think we'll continue to do so in the future. That these are sites that are all already identified or will potentially be identified in the future as Silk Road properties. But I offer this side, slide in the short time available just to give you a sense of the scale of what's happening. So where does that lead us in terms of digital acquisitions? So the, the theme I want to just quickly emphasize is what we're seeing is a grand scale of both digital acquisition and digital production around cultural uh, heritage, around muse museology, and, and in different multiple sectors of the heritage and museum industries. So here's a slide of the GIS uh, types of technology that we see around World Heritage nominations. So through the Silk Road, we're seeing a new production of cartographic ontologies around the geocultural and imaginary of connected trade histories and peaceful exchange. And this has multiple implications, which we might come back to. But what we're also seeing is this play out in a much, much bigger scale than just individual sites. And so the digital Belt and Road program or digital Silk Roads, which you might have heard about, Here's one example of that that was launched in 2017 across multiple areas, urban development, climate and environment research and study, but you see in the middle there, natural and cultural heritage. And so what that's also leading to is um, an extraordinary situation where um, Chinese universities are now renting satellites off the Chinese government for a million dollars a minute, producing satellite cultural landscaping imagery that is, that is of the Silk Roads. So digital uh, mapping affords this scale, affords this scale of thinking and cartography um, around this geocultural concept, which produces new narratives of history at the scale of continents and oceans, based around ideas and histories of, of transmission and trade and exchange and so on and so forth. And it's a digital uh, domain that facilitates particular imaginaries of the past, as we see in this example, to think of Egypt and China as connected civilizations. And these are the types of historical narratives we're see, now seeing enter international cultural policy and being uh, entered into organizations such as UNESCO. So it's, a, it's also a platform for using the language of civilizational past as a basis for strengthening bilateral ties in the present. Now, it's not only happening on, on land. Um, China is one of the three countries with deep water submersibles. This is an example of that. Um, that uh, now with China now surveying uh, some of the deepest parts of the ocean bed around the world, and particularly in, in uh, the geographies within, within uh, its region. And so this is also part of the search for, for um, uh, shipwrecks, which testified to the story of the Maritime Silk Road uh, as it's going forward and entering into new, uh, as I say, into new policy arenas. But this, this, this digital acquisition is also happening in interesting ways around new crowdsourcing projects around Silk Road histories. And so here's an example of one um, through, uh, again, through and what we're seeing is an interface between the technology giants of China in national institutions and universities, as, as, an, as this project um, uh, speaks of. And what that's also doing is using um, China's unprecedented asset, which is the tourist. Um, up until 2019 and the closing of borders, around 140 million Chinese tourists were um, traveling around the world in, um, and, and undergoing international or crossing international borders. So this is now a, a, an extraordinary asset for crowdsourcing and producing new narratives of history, which are feeding into these um, university and, and technology projects um, around um, 
around building uh, virtual reproductions across multiple domains, as, as I'll shortly show. Um, and then the Silk Road providing an umbrella and an architecture for understanding this narrative of world history. So the question then is, how does all this data collection, which I'm, again, I'm just rushing through because of time, produce new forms of cultural and heritage production? Well, China has undergone an unprecedented uh, scale of muse museum opening in the, in, since, uh, I guess, in the last 12 to 15 years with around four to 5,000 museums. This is a massive investment in cultural infrastructure and about the preservation of the past, both um, domestically and what we're seeing now is more internationally. And I think, therefore, we might think of that in terms of Tony Bennett's work, in terms of an exhibitionary complex, and what that looks like uh, going forward. So examples like this with, where museums that are in Xi'an, the city of Xi'an, but also um, uh, looking towards new narratives of where China sits in uh, Asian history, Eurasian history and world history. Um, and, and, uh, and so avatars and digital forms that are being used as part of this, um, of this production of the past in new ways, I think. Um, and so China's uh, estimated to account for around 30% 30, 30 of global spending of technologies, the VR technologies in 2020, 2021, um, with around 85 million headsets that were estimated to be in circulation at the end of last year. And that's part of a larger international digital scanning program around ideas of civilizational uh, histories. And, and the Silk Road narrative puts China at the center of this. Um, and again, I would say, um, look at the interfaces between the technology companies such as Tencent, universities and national institutions, and the ways in which this is building platforms for international cooperation going forward. And to come back to that, uh, that investment in VR and the Maritime Silk Road is a narrative for gaming, is a narrative for historical um, uh, education uh, that's running across different domains and reimagining world history around maritime connectivities. And this opens up really interesting uh, debates around, uh, around the role of history and, and, um, in, and in the public sector in China more internationally. We're seeing this also, um, this Silk Road history transferring and transforming its way into um, the, the phone industry, obviously the, the digital um, connectivities of Belt and Road that are rolling out, more than just infrastructure that you hear on the international media. So these are two examples of WeChat mini programs. And that raises questions, are we seeing China as the first digital civilization and the Silk Road being central to that? Um, and this is part of an investment that runs across the, the Belt and Road partners uh, in uh, going forward over the coming years. So to go back to that international collaboration that we're seeing through Belt and Road, what I'm getting at is that the Belt and Road is providing a political economy of cultural production that produces new narratives of Eurasian and world history, ideas of centers and peripheries of cultural exchange, religion, trade, so on and so forth. And here's an example of, of from Tunisia. And it's a digital, it's a central to that, digital acquisition, digital production. And I think what we're seeing is this is a start of a, of a, um, of a, uh, of a wave that I think will continue over the medium to longer term with China and other countries in Asia putting lots of uh, significant investments into organizations such as UNESCO that, in the way that Japan did in, in the 1990s. So to briefly summarize and pull a few of those threads together then, what I'm suggesting is that through the Silk Road Belt and Road Nexus, we're seeing a vast arena of geocultural diplomacy emerge, emerge that's playing out across multiple digital domains. And I've given you a few examples of that in the short time available. This is leading to new narratives of history, both within China, uh, new narratives of history for Asia, Eurasia, and world history. And it's being driven, I think, by South-South cooperation. And that opens up interesting debates around shifting away from Eurocentric histories, um, non-Western histories, um, the Black Lives Matter and, and rethinking about world histories around the histories of slavery. Um, where does non-Western countries sit into that? This, all of these uh, debates are kind of have different perspectives once you look at South-South forms of cooperation. And the ways in which that's feeding into international policy, I think will, be, um, have, will have various implications over the coming years. And so what I'm also suggesting is that China is emerging as a leader of digital heritage in a way that I think a lot of, uh, certainly academia hasn't picked up and I think a lot of uh, institutions in Australia, Europe and, and North America haven't really begun to understand yet. And so finally, I would say that what we're also leading to and what we need to understand is the politics of digital diplomacy that's emerging through this Silk Road, Belt and Road nexus, the Sinocentric histories that might be emerging, new regimes of mapping that are happening at a transnational and trans 
uh, transoceanic and transcultural scale. And there's many implications of that. So I'll stop there. And uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, a, a kind of research agenda that I think um, needs to be sort of uh, undertaken more widely in the coming years. Thank you so much, Tim, for this uh, really fascinating insights from your project. And by, I believe that this focus on the digital domain in, re in relation to cultural production and historical reconstruction through Chinese Belt and Road Initiative is quite novel. And indeed, it's really illuminating for our explorations of how soft power operates in the cyberspace through transcultural and transnational circulations uh, of narratives and imaginaries of the past charged with political mass. I do have a question for you about the China sure. firewall, right, <laughs> and uh, how it relates and, uh, and does it prevent uh, a more kind of uh, uh, productive uh, uh, digital reconstruction of the, uh, this Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, so if you could quickly address that, because you also mentioned this crowdsourcing activities, right, mm. uh, and it involves the public. So if China right now is divided in the global domain, from the rest of the world through a China wall, how does it somehow prevent this more productive, uh, you know, digital diplomacy and digital soft power? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, um, we may be at the beginning of a new kind of geopolitical divide. Um, uh, people are talking about a new Cold War. Um, so whether that maps out over the coming years and decades, we will see, obviously. But, the, but what is clear is that... Um, I was attending events in Turkey and Greece, et cetera. And it was very clear that, um, uh, that think tanks were suggesting to agencies who were trying to push tourism or their tourist industry towards the Chinese market that you say, you have to be present on the, on the ecosystem that is now developed. So forget the, um, uh, the Google uh, review systems and so on and so forth that, um, that uh, most Western tourists to use that category are familiar with. There's a whole domain which now um, these Belt and Road countries are now being, becoming aware that they should be part of. So, so that kind of um, sidesteps this, this uh, simplistic idea of a kind of a of a of a closed um, international um, uh, the, the, where, where China's ring fencing itself from from the rest of the world digitally. Um, and then um, uh, and and then yes, it's it's uh, also the ways in which uh, the Belt and Road. Uh, infrastructure, both digitally and physically, is creating this new geography of connectivity, and and there's ways in which that's that's working across multiple cultural sectors. Um, that will, whether that how how that's you know contained within a, um, a kind of geography that is just Belt and Road. But I think what's interesting is the ways in which then it gets embedded in organisations such as UNESCO and gains prestige, gains legitimacy, that enters into so there's collaborations I've flicked up on a screen as collaborations with the Louvre with the museums in the UK Sweden Netherlands so on and so forth so so it's not so notions of soft power where China's analysis is by a lot of sort of American Washington based think tanks will say well it's got a soft power deficit because uh, Confucius institutes are failing the Silk Road is a geocultural form that's not uh, Chinese it's it's a geocultural imaginary of the past within which Chinese civilization and Chinese history sits but National Geographic, uh, UNESCO is now pumping all this money into Silk Road histories. National Geographic's making documentaries, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so Disney's making films around Silk Road history. So, so it's a way to rethink uh, um, cultural diplomacy um, in a way that's outside just the nation state framework, which is, a, which is the ways in which we think about soft power um, typically. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. It's, it's really fascinating to realize that we are at the age right now of a new <laughs> structural shift in a geopolitical digital uh, cultural infrastructure. So thank you for your insights. Let me now invite Professor Cornelio Biola to the floor. And Cornelio is also investigator in the project Glam and Digital Soft Power. And he's a professor in diplomatic studies at the University of Oxford and head of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group. Cornelio will facilitate a discussion with each of our panel panelists during the first interactive practitioner panel and he will introduce all speakers uh, respectively. Cornelio, please take it from here. Thank you very much, Natalia, for, for the introduction and thank you also, uh, Professor Winter, for a fascinating intervention at the beginning. We much to discuss probably later. Um, so now moving on to the, to the second part of our uh, discussion today, the interactive data panel. 
So the, the purpose of this panel is to bring together practitioners and those also who have been involved in, in uh, uh, applying different uh, data methods, data approaches to um, uh, the activities of GLAM institutions. And what we are particularly interested to discuss in the next uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so, is how the data generated, I'm sorry, generated by museum and cultural institutions contribute challenge or contest city governance. And we are um, fortunate to uh, be joined today by uh, uh, four uh, brilliant speakers. I'm going to introduce uh, them one by one and then invite them to uh, uh, make a short intervention, five, 10 minutes. Um, so after that, uh, we're going to open up for, for q and I also encourage, so uh, during the, uh, the intervention, if the, the people, uh, um, the participants in the audience uh, like to make a comment uh, or to raise a question, to use a chat room as well. So I'll, I'll try to pick on some questions at the la later on in the Q&A uh, Q session. So that being said, let me start in the order listed in the program uh, with Jonathan Biz uh, Medina. Uh, who is a game designer from Brazil uh, with a, a very strong uh, um, uh, experience in using video games technology to create entertainment, art, educational, and business to business project. Um, he contributed to about 160 digital projects since 2012. Uh, uh, for a wide range of platforms, including VR and AR. So one recent one that I enjoyed uh, 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 watching and also engaging with was a virtual Helsinki, the Sounds of Season, which is an art project made to promote the city of Helsinki uh, and Finland using VR. So let's, uh, uh, Jonathan, um, let me invite you now to, uh, to uh, make your uh, intervention. I said, you know, five, 10 minutes would be ideal um, so that we can have more time for the Q&A. Five minutes, says, <laughs> says Natalia. So Jonathan, please go ahead. All right, well, thank you for, for the opportunity to present about the project here and also the introduction there. Uh, so the project I'm talking today is, uh, is the Turku 1827, which is a reconstruction of the city of Turku in Finland, which used to be the previous capital of the country that was destroyed by a great fire in 1827. And this project it is made for the Museum of History and the Future, which is a new museum that is being planned out for the city to open in 2029. And it's a museum that will contemplate both the history of the city, but also the future and the consequences of that history on, on the city. And this project is uh, one of the first big projects that we developed for them that uh, we are using the video games technology not only to reconstruct the city and kind of create different representations of how it used to look like or how the city behaved in a sense, uh, but also we are creating an open source library of those files. So uh, the goal of the museum is also to use these contents to promote new experiences, to promote different creative solutions and even educational programs uh, with the museum. And the project uh, itself, it has been, uh, it, it, it was being developed for the past two years. We are using the Unreal Engine 5, which is one of the newest video game stack. Uh, and the big difference for this technology is that it also allowed us to create the whole city at once. You know? So that helped not only for the technical part you know, of creating like the, the 3D world and things like that, but it also helped, for example, the management parts that we were able to reconstruct like a huge environment like that by a fraction of what a video game production would, would usually cost. Uh, but it also allowed us to have a, a faster iteration with the researchers to understand and adapt the reconstruction of the city as we were uh, building the different parts. You know? so, not only my team learned a lot from the projects you know, about the history of the city, but for sure also the researchers were asking new questions and were kind of forced, let's say, you know, to see some details on new perspectives. And the good thing about this whole project is that it kind of translates the whole research and the whole data of the city at that time to a more accessible or digestible way to the common public, you know. So this uh, this type of project is something that I have seen multiple times over those uh, past 10 years developing projects that it communicates not only to the 
highly academic people, but even like to the illiterate people you know, who maybe have never heard of uh, Turku before, or let's say even the video games technology. And the whole project also serves now as a base. I'll just skip like a bit more to the forward here. Uh, it also serves as a base for us to start developing new experiences, new products, telling new histories about the city or engaging the public in different ways. You know? So uh, there is no basically physical limits you know, to what we can develop here. And we can start representing not only the Turku now in 1827, but also different eras of the past and even the future if, you, if that's intended to. So I'll be happy to share more details and talk about the, the projects, you know, but thank you for watching and let's move forward. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, uh, amazing project, um, and I'm sure that there will be some questions about you know the larger implications uh, for today, um, uh, city governance uh, as well. So let me uh, now move to the second uh, uh, speaker, Lorenzo uh, uh, Gilgreen uh, Grandi, uh, who Dr. Grandi is the founder and director of the City Diplomacy Lab at Columbia Global Centers in Paris, and the lecturer in City Diplomacy at Columbia Undergraduate Global Engagement, also in Paris and Sciencespo. Um, he is the author of a uh, recent book uh, with Paul Grave on city diplomacy um, and um, uh, holds a PhD in political theory from uh, they call the, uh, the sci social sciences um, uh, as well. So, um, Lorenzo, um, again, you know, uh, the same format, please, in about five minutes intervention. Um, uh, and we we'll follow up then, you know, with the QA later. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Cornelio. Thank you, Natalia, for the invitation and hello to everybody. I'm going to share with you my screen as well. Just a second. So, of course, my presentation will be about uh, city diplomacy and how city diplomacy relates to the topic in question today. And uh, it's uh, going to be a very brief presentation. Uh, I will define what is uh, uh, this is a particular dimension of uh, city diplomacy, which is smart cultural city diplomacy, uh, which represents a, a new tool for city branding and uh, soft power for municipal areas. Uh, we'll also present a case study um, that I've been uh, uh, advising uh, over the last uh, few months. And then, of course, we can have a quick debate. So I think it's important to briefly introduce what city diplomacy is and how it works. So city diplomacy is uh, uh, simply said, it's the international action of municipal governments, and they do so in order to uh, pursue both their global interests and universal values. And this really parallels what the states uh, and uh, other levels of government can do on the international stage. And in terms of how it works, well, cities connect to each other on an international stage uh, when they identify that they have shared challenges. They do have something in common and they want to tackle this uh, together. And there are a variety, as we will see, of challenges that they're actually shared, that they are global in nature, but local in impact. Uh, when they identify that, they start designing and implement joint action. They can do this bilaterally, multilaterally, we will see. Uh, there is a strong component of peer learning and knowledge exchange. This is truly uh, the, the reason why CD started, in fact, to cooperate, is they knew that since these challenges are shared, there are good solutions that can uh, maybe have been developed uh, on the opposite side of the planet, but can be ap applicable and can be very uh, useful in another context. Uh, and finally, there is a strong component of national and international advocacy. Of course, this advocacy uh, to be uh, independent from the national uh, advocacy and the foreign policy itself, it requires an important level of decentralization and subsidiarity. There are many dimensions of city diplomacy, and uh, as you can see, it ranges from culture and creativity, equity and inclusion, research and technology, economic growth and attractivity, where you also have the branding uh, component, uh, environment and climate change, peace and reconciliation, international solidarity. Uh, it's important to say that most of these uh, uh, sectors are usually tackled jointly. There is not uh, many programs that only focus on the environment without also taking 
consideration, for example, uh, the component of social impact of climate change. Uh, when there is peace and reconciliation, there is also a component of uh, solidarity on a trans uh, uh, border uh, dimension. And today, uh, of course, I'm going to go fast, but we can go back on this uh, uh, cross uh, fertilization of sectors. I will uh, take a, 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 an insight on how cultural and creativity uh, can cooperate and ca can be matched with research and technology and economic growth and attractivity. So this is what is called smart cultural city diplomacy. And to go immediately into examples, uh, there are many possibilities for cities uh, to uh, cooperate with this uh, economic, uh, digital, and cultural sectors uh, all together. Uh, starting from the internationalization of uh, cultural and creative enterprises, cultural and creative industries, startups. This happens both on a bilateral and multilateral level. Uh, this, of course, has a focus on, on the, those young talents that can benefit from the internationalization and connection from the municipalities. There is an interesting uh, example of that in a project called Global Business Exchange that have been developed by the cities of New York, the city of Paris, and the city of Milan, each one focusing on the specificities of the cultural and creative uh, environment of the city, uh, of the three cities. Uh, of course, there are also connecting cultural events uh, where uh, the different cultural institution, they uh, make a team and they collaborate on a cross-border dimension. Once again, Paris is one of the uh, most uh, famous example of that, and they do so through bilateral approach, what they call cultural tandems with cities such as uh, Rome or New York. Uh, there are a lot of other activities such as uh, hackathons, uh, urban hackathons focusing on the cultural and creative industries, uh, and this is where uh, creativity uh, from students, from uh, uh, practitioners is put uh, at the uh, uh, service of uh, um, uh, public, of the public good, and this is something we are currently doing uh, uh, in the uh, City Diplomacy Lab, uh, as, as well, of course, the uh, heritage and creativity platforms uh, that really foster this uh, uh, branding through the uh, creativity, through uh, the culture and the heritage, both tangible and tangible. And I would like to focus on that uh, quite briefly. Uh, an example of that uh, is this uh, project called Parter. It's uh, short for European Network for a Participated Valorization of Cultural Heritage. It's an EU-funded initiative involving six different cities in Europe. And while, of course, just like any European initiative, it has a focus of uh, uh, closing the ties or, or getting uh, people from different European uh, regions and countries together. Uh, <clears throat> it also has a very strong city branding activity, uh, which is participatory in nature, uh, given that uh, it involves the mapping, participatory mapping of what cultural heritage, both in its tangible and tangible components are, not according to historian or archeologists, but in fact, according to citizens. So this is a participatory mapping of uh, the heritage that is uh, co-built with the uh, different actors um, from with the museums, the citizens, associations, and so on, uh, in order to have this map that is uh, of course, something that uh, uh, redefines what the cultural heritage of a city is, at the same time uh, allows the city to advertise and brand itself, uh, including with those elements that were not uh, uh, identified initially by the administration as a key component uh, uh, of heritage. Uh, there are many other uh, activities that uh, go through the internet, and this has, of course, uh, started to grow up in particular during COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, had an initial uh, uh, very bad impact on, on city diplomacy, given that all the exchanges, the physical exchanges, the travel, the missions have been stopped, but a lot of platforms have been developed uh, to share best practices uh, and to give visibility to the uh, glam sector and the cultural and creative industries in general uh, for the different cities. For example, this is a, 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 a 
but the first uh, uh, image you see, the Ciudades Cultura, uh, Cultural Cities, it's uh, an initiative uh, jointly organized by the cities of Barcelona, uh, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, and Bogota, in order to advertise both the artists and the heritage of those cities in this uh, uh, four level cooperation. But there are a lot of uh, broader initiative. Uh, you can see the International Association of Francophone Mayors, uh, the OECD Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth, the International Observatory for Mayors of Living Together, and the UNESCO Creative Cities Network that have been developing uh, platforms to share best practices and also to cope with the difficult impact of uh, the pandemic, the stop of tourism and travels on the glam sector, on the cultural and creative industries in order to support this uh, difficult time together. Well, all in all, a quick conclusion. Well, if we can, you know, we have to wrap up. Uh, this is the conclusion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is the conclusion. It's it, it just to say that uh, pr provided there are these three conditions, which are participatory approach on a local level, subsidiarity approach on national level and the capacity to interact on a city to city partnership on a cross border level, we have uh, experienced and we're experiencing every day more a swift, flexible and context specific action. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Again, you know, very interesting uh, uh, presentation, especially in the context of the post pandemic period, how these project initiatives are going to uh, develop and continue. Let me move now um, uh, to our third speaker, which is Matthew Davies. Uh, he is Professor of Ur Urban History and Executive Dean of Social Sciences, History and Philosophy at Birkbeck University of London. Uh, his research focuses on uh, medieval and early modern cities, particularly the history of London. He's the director of the Layers of London project. I think it connects uh, quite interestingly with the presentation of Jonathan um, that we've seen a little bit earlier on part two. Um, so uh, uh, Matthew is the director of the Layers of London project, which is combines digital mapping with public engagement to uncover different uh, diverse history of London and its peoples over many centuries. So Matthew, uh, uh, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me and see my, my screen okay. Um, yep. So I'm going to talk about the Layers of London project, which I've been directing for about six years now, and its contribution to digital placemaking and heritage strategies. Um, what is, what is Layers of London, first of all? Uh, okay, well, it's a digital mapping and public engagement project, which looks at London uh, throughout many centuries. Um, it involves, first of all, uh, lots of digitized maps from our heritage partners, but also geolocated geo data that our partners have supplied. But then a key component is the participatory mapping and community projects that have so far created more than 12,000 uh, records um, on, on the website. And those records can form collections, but also contribute to walking trails and other, other features. As I say, we've been going since 2016, and we moved to a new platform, which I'll briefly mention at the end, called Humap in 2021. And these are some of our partners. Most of them are, are both national and local partners in the sense that they are national heritage bodies like Historic England, National Archives, but they have significant London, London related collections. So uh, our aims really are twofold. Um, they involve uncovering and sharing histories and narratives of London and its people and places, um, and particular heritage that's disappearing or lost, which we want to recover and preserve. But it's also about sort of co-curation, working with groups and organizations to, to jointly curate and share that heritage. And in doing so, contribute to digital heritage and engagement strategies of organizations and then therefore to tourism governance and so on. There's a couple of slides showing uh, the, the, the site and how it looks. These are our overlays, the maps, and also some of our uh, tagged uh, content. Uh, and one of our maps, the London Bomb Damage Map from London Metropolitan Archives. Um, and we also worked with partners such as UCL's Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, and some of the data that they have supplied is on our website too, looking at slave ownership and its legacy in London uh, in the 19th century and beyond. So in terms of our work with heritage partners, we've worked with a lot of London boroughs in particular, as well as these national organisations. We have to remember that London is sort of governmentally quite complex in some ways, so trying to contribute to those strategies is really important. Um, our public engagement work involves co-curation, so we're trying to add value to the heritage that we are, we are looking at, um, whether it's sort of very personal records or records to do with governments or, or other things, and then trying to disseminate 
uh, this heritage, which is often sort of hidden, locked away, um, huge collections that have not been digitized yet, um, or else they're digitized but not yet fully available. And then using our platform to connect this heritage together. So having con collections from um, the National Archives or Historic England means they can be linked together and interrogated using place as that sort of vehicle to do that. And then finally, thinking about developing skills and capacity within our partner organisations is really, really important. Um, training staff, training volunteers in particular. So spreading that sort of awareness of uh, and use of digital skills more widely, um, which I think is a key part of the heritage strategies of many organisations now to build that broader capacity beyond your staffing. And just on the right hand side, you can see one of the, the major collections that we have, which is supplied by Historic England, which is 24,000 aerial photographs taken at the, just after the Second World War, which uh, volunteers geo-referenced for us, and then we've stitched together to create a single image of London um, immediately after the Second World War. So a couple of quotations from our partners to, to, to demonstrate the sort of value we've, we've tried to bring to those organisations with, with our projects, both in dissemination, skills, expertise, and, and so on. And then working with partners has been an incredibly important part of what we're doing. So broadening the, the base, if you like, the glam base, so to speak, um, the democratization of, of heritage, unrecorded stories and narratives, sharing what we might call informal archives that are not yet made available. Um, they're in poor condition in some cases and need to be preserved. And then thinking particularly about the significance of place and heritage within that context. So connecting the past, present and future with often in quite difficult and contested circumstances as with um, the um, what used to be called the Jeffrey Museum in London, the Museum of the Home, as it's called now because of the associations of Robert Jeffrey, the, the, the original founder uh, of the museum, so to speak, with slavery. Um, so that's been quite interesting and, and quite difficult um, set of debates. But then, you know, trying to create models for engaging communities with heritage is really, really important. So communities of interest and not just communities of place. I think the overlap between those two has been very important. And a couple, you know, a quotation here from, you know, we, we've got a lot of data about the um, with the Windrush um, arrivals in, in, in London in 1948 um, and how significant our project was for those for those descendants of the Windrush generation um, in terms of the project telling their stories which I think yeah, adds a huge amount to, to what we know about um, that period of history and its relevance today. And then just a, a, an example of a project that involves connecting communities with heritage organizations. And this is a partnership with the, the National Trust called Corner Shop Stories. And this is about sharing migration stories through particular kinds of places. In this, kind of, in this case, it's uh, about corner shops in, in London. And that's, and that's allowed the National Trust um, to reach new kinds of audiences. One doesn't necessarily associate the National Trust or previously with this kind, of, this kind of work, but it's really helped to empower the National Trust to reach beyond its sort of stately home kind of focus in the past 100 years or so to working with communities, thinking about new kinds of heritage assets and working with community groups. And then another part of the collaboration has been to develop infrastructure. So uh, our technical partners, um, are called HUMAP and they developed a platform which is now used for seven or eight mapping projects of this kind and you know this is a really useful way to you know work with the private sector um, to create this kind of infrastructure that can benefit other projects as well. And then finally just some conclusions from, from our work I think it's particularly the case that the, the pandemic's had a major impact on all of the organizations we've worked with, but also on our project. And it's in a sense has accelerated a number of the developments that we've, we, we've, we've been working on. Um, I think it's clear that you know, digital tools can promote this kind of engagement with heritage and by different kinds of audiences in particular, working with GLAM organizations. And you know, it's been really important in shaping their strategies. Um, it was clear when we started the project that there was an alignment in London between different heritage bodies in terms of what they wanted to do. And I think the pandemic has sort of accelerated that. I think it's really important, you know, in terms of trying to create and share these narratives of urban, of urban identities and place, not just the, the past, past legacies, but also present debates and future um, ideas, future debates about how communities and places are going to develop in the future. I think our projects played a, an interesting role in those debates in different parts of London over the past five or six years. And then finally, you know, the, 
our project, like so many other projects represented here, um, sees the value of co-curation as a way to increase the value and impact of heritage uh, in, a, in a post pandemic work world. I think working with with volunteers, working with community groups, I think that that interaction between those groups and GLAM institutions is really, really significant. So that's all I want to say today. I, I look forward to discussing this later with all of you. Um, this is the project team, just so you can have a look and our contact details. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. A very uh, detailed, comprehensive, and data rich project. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward actually to exploring it myself um, in the coming days as well. So let's move, uh, move now to the, to the last speaker in our data interactive panel, Morgan Curie. Um, she's a lecturer in data and society in science, technology, and innovation studies at the University of uh, Edinburgh. Her research and teaching interests focus on automation in the welfare state, governments, and algorithms. Uh, open administrative data, activist data practices, cultural mapping, and critical GIS. She's uh, the principal investigator of the Culture and Communities Mapping Project, uh, this uh, ECRC funded study, Automating Universal Credits, and co leads the Digital so uh, uh, Social Science Research Cluster at the University of uh, Edinburgh. So, uh, Morgan. Um, uh, the same uh, uh, format, uh, please, you know, five, uh, five minutes if you can. Great, thanks so much. So I'm going to talk about the Culture and Communities Mapping Project, which has been around since 2018. Uh, and we use cultural mapping, which uh, some of the other um, panelists have also spoken about. Uh, we define it as a process for involving communities in identifying and recording cultural assets to produce collective knowledge that can inform strategies, planning processes, or other initiatives. Um, and just to point out, we also see it as a way to study those processes. So also to look at how people um, conceive of boundaries, how they think about classifying places, um, how they might rank them um, uh, as places of value. So it's, it's also kind of a, a point of entry into more theoretical debates about um, how we produce spatial knowledge and spatial representations. So just some uh, images. So for, in 2019, we carried out cultural mapping workshops across the city to create a cultural map of Edinburgh. We did this in collaboration with the, um, the uh, City of Edinburgh Council. And so you can see some of these events. Um, a lot of people getting together in a room. Uh, here we also would take the map to uh, events that were taking place in any case to try to get more participants. And we had about 125 people take part. Um, this is the result. It's the what we call the Edinburgh Cultural Map. It has over 1,300 spaces identified. Um, and we also added context layers to this to give uh, a, a deeper understanding of these spaces in relation to other sociodemographics and um, geographic features of the city. So here you can see on the left-hand side the list of additional layers like um, Edinburgh's listed buildings, waterways, uh, cycle paths. This here that you see is actually the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation from 2020. So you can see the spaces in the context of some of the um, socioeconomic differences across the city. Uh, in 2021, we partnered with Festivals Edinburgh, which is an umbrella organization for the 11 kind of major festivals in the city. And the project we called Mapping Cultural Dispersal. And this, I think other panelists have kind of identified um, how a lot of major cultural institutions are starting to look more locally and to engage more locally. So um, festivals have traditionally been very interested in, in gaining an international audience. But in the past couple of years, they've really started to reflect on how they relate to um, people living in Edinburgh and especially living in areas that have traditionally not engaged with festivals. They have hard ticketing data on who is and who is not and where they live. Uh, so this was a, a project with them to try to reach out to some of those areas in town that have traditionally not engaged and also to um, reimagine how they might, uh, how their engagement activities and how their ticketed offerings might be spread a bit more um, equitably across the city. Um, currently, they're, they take place very much in the city center. So uh, to do this during the pandemic, we, instead of having people gather around on tables, um, uh, looking at, at one large map, we uh, gave participants packets of materials and we reached them by working with six community hubs and six different neighborhoods across the city. 
uh, and, and this way we were able to reach 70 participants. And at these workshops, they would get their individual packets, they had maps um, of their neighborhood and of the city. And then we also asked them to take photographs in advance of places that, uh, that, that they valued. And the purpose of the workshops was twofold. So, and first of all, it was to, um, to run cultural, uh, uh, to, to create a cultural map of these neighborhoods, um, of places that people really cared about and places that, that were important to the community that they took photographs of and to collect stories of these places. Um, but we also asked them about festivals. How do you, do you engage with festivals? How would you like festivals to be more engaged in, in your area? Uh, so we had three um, outputs from this. So one, we created cultural maps of these, these communities and then gave them back to the cultural hubs to use, um, to continue to use for cultural mapping exercises. So here's an example. Um, one of the hubs printed it out on vinyl and they use it to um, strategize um, and advocate for their community. Another output was a uh, report for the festivals uh, communicating what people, what participants said. Um, it, it was very clear that participants do want festivals to engage more in their community, to have ticketed offers, not just um, uh, not just uh, community engagement activities going on in, in their communities. And the report was picked up by some local um, news outlets. So that's what the, um, that's what's there on the right-hand side. And then finally, we are, currently working with festivals to create a map that can help them be um, more strategic um, to both understand their current um, community engagement and where their venues are around the city, but also to uh, help them kind of strategize how they might direct resources in the future. So here you can see, again, the Scottish index of multiple deprivation showing different shades across the city. The city and this is showing their 2019 community engagement activities. They can look and see who they're reaching out to and who they then they can imagine who they might reach out to in the future. So this is kind of an in progress um, map right now with the festivals um, to use as a tool to act upon the findings that, that uh, came out of the report and the workshops. Um, so yeah, so I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Morgan. Um, again, you know, very we're right on time. Um, uh, we have a few minutes now for, for the Q&A uh, part. Um, so one, one uh, question that I like to ask all participants, uh, and I like to go back a little bit to this uh, relationship between dam institutions and cities uh, and city governance, and to zoom on, uh, on, on this relationship between the two. I've been wondering whether you can comment, uh, uh, each of you, on this idea of uh, the opportunities that this digital um, activities of gram institution present for cities and also in terms of, of the challenges. Uh, what exactly from your different projects, what seems to be the, the best opportunities for this relationship, but also the challenges that you've uh, seen uh, through your work in terms of how this relationship between cities and GLAM institution can prosper. Thank you also those who have uh, contributed in the chat room. I see that Matthew already responded to the question. There is an additional question for uh, Jonathan. Uh, from Yvonne about uh, how gaming and crowd sources open data relate. Uh, um, what is the end purpose uh, for, of, of this experience, especially you know, for, for the public? So um, let me um, uh, we use the same uh, 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 way of, of addressing. We'll start with Jonathan and then move uh, um, uh, to, to the rest of the participants. So Jonathan, what do you think? What, what, it is, what are the, the main challenge and also the opportunities for, for cities and, and GLAM institutions to, to work together in this area from your perspective? All right, well, we are talking about my perspective, you know, what I see from the video games technologies that it gives a good opportunity for us to also validate some data, especially when we talk about the past, you know, like same way that we do like reenactments or reconstructions of historical things and you know, all the technology that allow us to check that uh, without having like to spend physical resources, let's say, on, on uh, making sure that that happens, you know, but also, I think another important thing is that uh, the video games technology itself, it helps us to kind of translate or kind of chew up, you know, like digest some of the data to the public. You know, because usually the data is, of course, uh, the data is very important, very relevant. Uh, but if you don't understand the context of this data, then it might not mean anything to the, 
to the public. And so uh, the video games technology kind of combines uh, both worlds there, you know, like it presents you the data and the context, you know, so you, not only you are being fed the information, but you are also experiencing that information. You know? And I think that's one of the main, uh, the main deals there that this technology brings to the table. Maybe one of the biggest challenges, I think it's the definition of the scope, you know, at least like, let's say for the project I have done here, the Turco project, because we haven't done a specific narrative for the project, you know, like we have created an empty canvas, or let's say a canvas with the city of Turco there. So from there, we can start uh, creating different experiences, validating things, and also generating more data. You know? So one good example we have is that from that project, we start working with a, a different uh, museum institution in the city of Turku to reuse the same project that was developed to kind of create this other part of, of the city with more details and the research that this other museum had. You now to then we can create like other products, let's say like educational tours, uh, videos or photos and things like that. You know? So I think that's when this project actually goes to the public and so when we will actually see the results of the different contributions of all of the different sorts of data, the institutions and the people contributing to kind of feed that canvas with uh, new experiences. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much um, also, you know, for, for highlighting these, these two aspects. Uh, um, do you want to add anything, you know, to the question from Yvonne about, you know, the, the, the relation with crowdsourcing space, open space, and how do they relate um, the gaming? Who, what's the end purpose of, yeah. of this? Yeah. Of course, and also I think when we think about the open data, I think there's two different fronts there for this. You know, the one is the data that is fed to create the experience. So, for example, to create this uh, starter, uh, the starter part of the project that, that we have the city there, we use it some open data about like the geographic information of the city, like the city planning, even the researchers and other details that we have. But the other side is also the data that the project generates. You know? So for example, with those reconstructions, we can start pinpointing different data and different narratives to see like, let's say like we discovered that people could only produce uh, shipyards in this part of the city and where were they getting like the, the wood for those things. You know? So then we can start mapping and linking all the researches with this validation of the world there to kind of also give other data. You know? The people who are co contributing to this data, you know, as I said, I think it's a mix of like different institutions. You know, the city government, for example, is also contributing with a lot of material to this project. But I think the users will also feed this later with information, you know, even like this more informal type of data. Something that Matthew mentioned there. You know that let's say I I have personal recordings of my great grandfather who lived in Turku, and how can I put that into the city, you know, so then people can start adding this information, kind of enriching the layers of information mm -hmm. we have in that world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that also a great question about yes. validation of data and accuracy. Uh, thank you for, um, uh, you know, in the interest of time, uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I just have to, to, to move to. Uh, so Lorenzo, again, you know, from your perspective, you focused a lot on, on city diplomacy. Um, so how do you see, you know, this collaboration with GLAM institutions? You know, what, where do you see the opportunities? Where do you see the challenges for this relationship? Thank you very much, uh, Cornelio. Well, uh, very briefly, in terms of uh, opportunity, I was speak about the uh, sustainable development, sustainable development for the whole urban area, uh, because uh, this collaboration is in fact sustainable, it's uh, renewable, uh, there is no expiration date, of course, and can put in, uh, in action a, a very good mechanism for uh, the socioeconomic indicators, for creating jobs, uh, uh, creating economic growth, uh, which is a very, of course, uh, positive. And this can happen everywhere in the world, it's everywhere in the world. Uh, it can also uh, boost uh, uh, active citizenship and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, help identify a, a new, uh, a renewable and evolving uh, local identity and narrative, which is in particular inclusive because it is uh, co-created with the different uh, components of society, including the most recent uh, uh, inhabitants, the, the, the migrants that came recently and can be involved in this kind of initiative. In terms of challenge, 
Well, it's, uh, there is some evidence that uh, when successful, uh, this uh, cultural city branding of uh, municipalities create, of course, uh, uh, um, challenges to equity, especially in the terms of uh, gentrification. So we have uh, neighborhoods or sometimes even large part of uh, the city, which became almost unaffordable for part of the previous uh, residents. So of course, this has a bad negative impact that should be taken into consideration by uh, local leaders, by uh, local governments when uh, implementing those kind of activities. Uh, and finally, I, we have seen beautiful examples uh, that goes uh, all in the same direction and uh, there are others. Uh, there is, uh, I, I mentioned this for uh, Professor Winter, there is another initiative which is uh, urban, but uh, sponsored by China and done through UNESCO, uh, which is called, uh, not a very uh, appealing name, it's uh, uh, a community-based inventoring of intangible heritage in urban areas, long, long title, but very uh, effective and initiative that is going to be implemented in nine different cities across the world. Uh, by UNESCO, uh, and, and this is something that shows, <clears throat> and there are many other projects, that, that there is a lot of effort that is put in place, but there is in fact little interoperability. So every time organizations, universities, NGOs create new standards, new platforms, and, and that's a lot of effort, while in fact if there was some inter interoperability, this could be quicker. This is a broader discourse that is applicable to everything which is, in fact, the smart city. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, let me turn now to Matthew. And Matthew already, I think, developed or, uh, uh, this relationship between the uh, city of London and, and then the, the, the institutions and the different museums. You spoke about partnerships uh, and, and collaboration. Uh, so what did you see uh, in terms of, you know, how did, how did the city of London receive that? in terms of opportunities, in terms of, you know, using the type of data that you produce and um, the same for, for, for challenges. Where do you see the, the most, you know, the, the, the difficulties the arising uh, from, from this type of project for cities? I think we, 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 we found from the start that the, um, the institutional strategies of the organizations we worked with were, were at the right point. They were ready to, to engage with this kind of project. And they, they, they overwhelmingly believe that an extension of their role was to was to partner with communities and i think they, they perhaps lacked the at that point the both the digital tools and some of the overarching practical strategies for doing that um i think one of the key points that we've tried to sort of focus on is the idea of communities taking ownership of of heritage and that's something i think that um has gradually over the last five, 10 years, become much more part of GLAM institutions sort of mindset. So I think that's something we were able to take advantage of. Um, for example, about thinking about public spaces um, or monuments in, in, in London, in, in other cities, about trying to broaden, diversify the range of interpretations, for example, of those public spaces and, and monuments has been a really important part of our work. And I think that's something that's also fed into the work of, of institutions. I think that, that there are some, some, some challenges with that. Um, I think mob mobilizing is, is crucial. So you need resources to mobilize um, communities. So that comes with, with funding in many cases. Um, we in the UK have the Heritage Lottery Fund, as many, many of you know, which has been a, a really significant way of intervening um, and you know, creating the capacity, but also the skills, the technology to do this sort of work. So I think that's helped to address some of those challenges, but nonetheless, trying to, to mobilize and empower communities um, is not a straightforward thing necessarily. It involves getting out there as we've seen in, in Edinburgh and other places to actually work with communities to uncover hidden histories, hidden narratives, alternative narratives. And so, so you, you, you do encounter some barriers in doing that. Um, some of which are structural governmental um, barriers when particular organizations or governments don't necessarily think in that kind of way about how their public spaces should be should be thought of, should be organized, should be presented to the public, for example. Um, so an example of this is a couple of years ago, the City of London, um, or rather the Greater London Authority, introduced a commission for d diversity in the public realm. So there's funding available to, to, to rethink public space, rethink how that public space is interpreted. So you need that, that input, that commitment from, from government in particular. Thank you very much, Matthew. Again, you know, very, very comprehensive overview of, of what is happening in terms of opportunities. Also, you know, the, the, the difficulties that you mentioned uh, 
um, uh, coming out of this uh, experience. Um, so let me turn now to Morgan. Morgan, you, you use the word uh, engaging, right? You know, stimulating engagement, the community. And I thought that might be uh, um, a good starting point for this discussion about, you know, how do you see what seems to transpire from your project in terms of for the uh, city of Edinburgh, for the uh, 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 city authorities, um, but also, you know, for, for the cultural institution, in this case, the festival. Uh, where do you see the opportunity? Where do you see the, the, the challenges in this relationship? Yeah, I guess uh, uh, two things come to mind. So one, uh, it was uh, one thing we realized from the project that is that it was essential to have these what we call hubs as as liaisons into communities. So we couldn't have done any of these workshops without working with these uh, local community organizations, cultural organizations that have been in these communities for a long time and know the people and are trusted. So to have them uh, as intermediaries, I suppose, was was really, really important. And Edinburgh is lucky because most of these neighborhoods that um, uh, you know, the festivals identified as not engaging so much, they do have these institutions, these trusted institutions that were willing to work with us. And we did have to, I, I, I would just, you know, concur, it does take resources. So as Matthew was saying, um, we did get funding to pay the organizations for their time to help with recruitment. Um, that was, it, it, I, I couldn't have done, you know, we, as re researchers, you know, coming into the communities without, without those intermediaries, it, it wouldn't have been possible to carry off some of this work that we do. Uh, and they also, or their perspective is also really important to bring in from the beginning in the research design, I should say. Um, so we would, we consulted with them, for instance, what, what it, the structure of the workshops, what we're going to ask people um, and got their perspectives from the very beginning. And that was also really important uh, from the festivals and uh, oh, and we also all the results we shared with them before publishing anything and got and fed their perspectives into the reports as well. So I should say kind of involving them from the beginning through to the end of the project um, and having the, them as uh, giving them a critical role throughout um, that that made the project happen. And I'm talking about the mapping cultural dispersal project that we started last year. Uh, and then just to say something kind of a challenge for festivals, I suppose it's an opportunity and a challenge with regards to the the maps and the digital side of the project. So, I mean, I, I guess it's a, one interesting point is that a lot of the stories that came out of the project and a lot of the kind of cultural mapping that was relevant to the neighborhoods, that's all, that's not digital. I mean, there's, it, you know, the maps are very beautiful, but they're not interactive. They're not web maps mm -hmm. uh, and the reports analog, you know, it's a, it's a report. So. What's interesting is that the digital component of the project is, is very much a kind of uh, data driven tool for festivals and I would say both the opportunity and the challenge there is that they're they're getting their data out there they're being more transparent, so I guess that that's a benefit to the city is that uh, citizens if they go on go and want to use the map they can start to see well here's what here's where festivals have been putting their money here's where festivals have been putting this is where the venues are and this is where they're doing their community engagement so there's it's there's a bit there's going to be a bit more transparency around festivals activities than there has been i would say um mm -hmm. at least a kind of in, in, in immediacy to the map um the challenge i suppose the challenge being that um uh, you know, making sure they're happy with that, with how it's being presented, but also as a um, as a, a scholar, kind of a critical data studies, critical mapping, um, also want to make sure the data is contextualized and presented in a way that also shows that, you know, it's not always going to be complete. It has limitations and making sure to make that also make that very clear to the public once it's presented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morgan. And thank you all you know, for your um, excellent um, uh, interventions and also insight. Uh, don't want to, to linger more because I think Natalia is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, is wanted to, to move to the second, to the next page. Uh, so Natalia, I'm handing uh, uh, back to you. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Carnelo, for facilitating this really fascinating panel. And it's really amazing to see so many great digital projects happening right now that from different perspectives and their own particular ways contribute to digital place making. And I think these projects do expand and enrich digital identities of cities and serve as important communication channels for refining the city images by engaging communities, stakeholders, uh, and uh, cultural institutions in this digital urban representation so really great let me now move to the second interactive panel which will focus on smart city images and how various data aggregation circulation and representation points shape new urban images uh, it's my pleasure to facilitate this panel with three brilliant panelists and i will start with david bachelor planner and urban designer and an expert in smart heritage so uh, he completed his phd and his uh, doctoral thesis find the emerging smart heritage discourse for the first time in academic literature and produce recommendations to governments uh, in implementing smart heritage in their strategic policies and operation. So David, uh, please, the floor is yours right now. Brilliant. Hello, everybody. I'm David Batchelor from uh, Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, so my talk is going to be on my research that uh, defined smart heritage for the first time in academic literature. I did it as part of my PhD research a few years ago. So moving quickly. So as many people know, um, smart cities have been around for a good couple of decades. Well, the research um, and the discussion has been anyway. Um, is, and as part of that discussion over time, we've had many new discourses spin off of it um so we've had they've been termed different things um over time and also depending on your focus but as a offering we have smart infrastructure smart energy smart city services and the like um, my background is in heritage and so when i entered into this discussion i was looking for where heritage sat and i struggled to find um uh, sector or existing discourse that represented um, heritage in the smart city space. And so I did some further digging and found that smart heritage was novel. It was yet uh, to be formalized in the academic research. Uh, and there were murmurings of it in practical research, but it wasn't quite in focus yet. So through my research, um, I came up with the following definition of smart heritage. So smart heritage is a convergence between the smart city and heritage disciplines that intertwines the autonomous and automatic capabilities and innovation of smart technology with the contextual and subjective interpretation of the past. So in that underline, the first underlying section, that is the smart city aspect. And the second underlying part is the heritage aspect. That's a very quite a rudimentary definition, and I anticipate the definition to always um, evolve and change over time. But at this stage, it was a very basic way of going. We've got the smart city, we've got heritage, and they're now going to they're overlapping. Importantly, I find that smart heritage advances beyond digital heritage and virtual heritage, so it's not a subset of those two discussions. Uh, digital heritage as defined by um, the charter. Digital heritage is um, about recording and archiving primarily. Smart heritage is about that autonomous and automatic capabilities in the smart city. And so the technology itself is curating uh, the experience. It's not just recording it and then presenting it. Uh, so also smart city is I said emerging in academia, academia and real world applications. In my research, I found probably about 20 references to smart uh, heritage in some form. Um, probably only about four of them spoke to it directly and maybe added a couple of sentences about what it means, but, um, but there was no research in exactly the theoretical uh, support foundation of the discourse. So it's there but it's still emerging. Uh, the best example of smart heritage I found was 
um, this case study in a small historic town in Spain. And so they created a tourist walking app where the visitors to the town could enter the monuments they want to see in the town. And then the smart, uh, smart city system would create a walking tour that connects all of those um, monuments. However, the smart part of it is that it would use dynamic data. So um, sensors at all the different monuments would be able to measure the available visiting time, uh, the wait time, so if there's a large queues, um, and would be able to balance that against um, static data such as monuments location, open times, so where you are, and also how um, how much time you have available. So every tour would be different. This would be the smart aspect of this heritage experience, where the system would curate your own personal experience of this historic city. You can see there's a screenshot of the app there. Um, it was just a I don't believe it's operating yet anymore. It's more of a test case, but uh, but it shows that this um, this type of thinking was um, already there. It just needed some um, conceptual um, fleshing out. So, what can smart heritage offer cities? So, I uh, my research focused on local government policy um, in a, in Australia and New Zealand context, and I looked at where heritage and smart city um, local government policies overlap. And I found that currently they overlap in three areas, placemaking, interpretation and information, and also community aspects. I suspect that there will be further overlap in the future, and I surely hope there will be further overlap in the future as technology and heritage um, close their theoretical gap. But around placemaking, uh, Smart Heritage supports placemaking by emphasizing the identity of places through the development of technology and heritage. So the smart city in a basic sense um, can enhance people's understanding of place through data. Um, heritage uh, is helps people interpret um, places and make them stand out of people's um, mind's eye, so why is that place important? Um, it, it, they resonate with that historic value, and so therefore creating a place. Same with interpretation information, um, they can more just understand and pass information about that place, so the trading of um, historical information in the heritage sense and in the smart city sense, where it might be more about governance and things, but it's still that passing of information information so smart heritage can help there and also community as many of you all have touched on in your presentations uh, it's a people at the end of it so if people can use um, smart heritage to um, increase the social fabric of where they live um, connect in with their neighbor and um, feel at home that is a good outcome as well so um, in my research, I produced a smart heritage principles document. So it's a guide for local governments to adopt smart heritage in their uh, policies and operations. I found that smart heritage does exist in local governments already, um, but it exists through the kind of haphazard, unplanned um, interactions between smart city advisors and heritage advisors. So um, they might bump into each other. One example is um, one council that they literally bumped into each other in the hallway and started talking about what they're working on. And said, oh, this, you could help me with um, my project and you could help me with, and I could help you with your project. And through that, a smart heritage type outcome eventuated. And so this document enables people to firstly recognize that smart heritage exists in operation in their council and then be able to start the conversation to make a formalizer into the operational um, policy documents. So just as a quick reflection, um, that smart city and heritage disciplines, in my view, they're still very um, different in their worldview. 
in so and it will need further research to help them come together to develop smart heritage to formalize it to get more applications uh, and there's very little knowledge sharing between them at the moment we need those professionals and academics in the middle who are linking um, both disciplines together consciously uh, and then smart heritage also exposes challenges that can be quite confronting so with heritage we've got the authorized heritage discourse where the governments and um, other institutions want to control or authorize um, certain narratives uh, the smart city technology threatens that because the technology can curate unique experiences that may not be authorized and so that can use people's um, personal data their own personal experiences and um, collect uh, collective meshing of different data sets so i found in my research that local governments are a bit hesitant about that understandably so uh, but yeah smart heritage can be confronting and i can see that is in the negative and also positive sense as well and uh, David, um, thank you david i'm sorry okay. for the interruption but we need to move forward with other panelists but thank you very much for this really interesting and detailed presentation of what smart heritage is according to my understanding smart heritage is still a big kind of aspirational vision for many governments <laughs> so and uh, it's, it's really interesting to see your opinion that uh, in some places it's already emerging as a very important tool so uh, now let me invite Steve Watson to, to the floor, who is the data lead at the New Museum of London. As many of you might have heard, the Museum of London has embarked on a, a very interesting journey to create a new city museum that is currently being built at the heart of one of the capital's most historic and creative quarters, Smithfield General Market, and uh, conceived as a smart heritage project from its very uh, beginning. With over 30 years of experience in design and construction, Constructions of operations uh, in buildings and 20 years specializing in museum and heritage sector. Steve will take us behind the scenes of the data architecture of the new Smart Heritage Museum of London. Steve, please, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction, Natalia. Um, just let me share my screen. Okay, yeah, um, so yeah, my role is technical lead on the new Museum of London's project. And um, this one, as Natalia said, is in Smithfield, which is in central London. And it's one of the largest heritage projects uh, underway in Europe. So it's a fantastic uh, refurbishment and repurposing of the historic markets of London. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the new Museum of London project, um, the reason why we're building a smart museum, and a brief overview of how we will manage the data. So the, the easiest way for me to start is just to um, describe like in a construction sense, what's not smart. Um, and, um, you know, you can see from the image there, I've selected five different engineering systems and all these systems deliver uh, and then create data within a building. Um, on a previous building I worked on, there was 25 different systems. So just looking at five as an example, um, you can see that the way that it's delivered from a project is that you get specialists in to deliver the, each one of these packages and the data lives in its own world. There's no interoperability intended. Um, they speak different languages and it is not designed um, for sharing of information. And whilst that is good in a project, it's a disaster when you hand it over to the operation of the building. Um, and so just to pick a, a example, um, you know, within a museum, we meet with our facility management service providers, an outsourced organisation who help us run the building, and we would ask questions about how the building's running. So if we try to turn those questions into data, um, and just looking at this hypothetical question where, say, we want to know the occupancy in the museum, and we want to know how many lights are on and what energy that consumes, the FM service provider then needs to go to three separate subcontractors to get that information. And that information um, may only be accessible to them. And so when we ask that question, the question eventually gets to the subcontractors and they say, well, we can come in and it'll cost you some money, or we can wait till the end of the month. And then when we do a service visit, we can provide that information. So already at that point, 
the, um, the question, the business question becomes slow or expensive. And then when we do get the data, it's often in different formats. And so it becomes a problem of the facilities management service provider to try and format that data, which they're not particularly skilled at and it's not really part of the modern scope or the, the natural scope of an outsourced service provider. Um, so the data flow um, is, is, is a problem, you know, because there's no governance around how we manage the data within the building. The information comes from the sensors, goes into isolated systems or software. It's managed by the subcontractors who may or may not have an interest in sharing that data. It then goes to the facility management organization back to the client who quite honestly, we've sometimes forgotten what the question was by the time it gets back to us. And if it needs to be elevated to the museum executive, it gets reformatted again, you know, in a way that's an executive summary. So fundamentally, and at an infrastructure level, a smart building manages building data and makes it readily available and usable and readily available and usable to everyone within the museum and with, with out external to the museum as well. So ideally, this structure for the data and, and the way we will do it will be that we will move all the data into uh, one language and have it into a layer where everyone's looking at the same data. And so we don't need to uh, wrangle the data or move it from one format to another. Um, we're all looking at the same data and we agree on the same data. And that data is verifiable. Uh, you know, more realistically, the data will go into a cloud server. And then um, once it's in a cloud server, we can do different things like use different visualization tools as they develop over the next years. We can apply machine learning to the data and we can interact with that uh, cloud storage data um, via our phone or web apps. And we can also start to bring in other urban data or city of London or the greater London authority data into that, um, into that database as well. And, you know, for, for operators, for us, you know, this is an example of um, Grafana, which is a, we're using the free version and it's a, a visualization tool that we look at our time series data and we can make beautiful graphs now, which are more compelling and tell much better stories to the engineers and the building, people running the building. And, um, and we've, we've taken control of the data and um, we're taking responsibility for extracting the value out of that data. So the data we'll collect, we'll do, we'll collect and manage, we'll do many things. Um, we will use it to make the visitor experience as healthy and as comfortable as possible and in the most sustainable way possible. Um, it's yet to be developed, but we'll share our data with other buildings and urban environments in the Culture Mile, which is um, a section of um, London that's been um, extensively developed as a cultural centre point. Um, we'll use our data to inform and improve our organisational understandings via analytics and will play a significant role in the story of how smart museums and heritage um, organisations will develop and evolve in um, the smart city that London is becoming. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, for your right on time for your five minute talk. And thank you for exposing us to this high level of complexity that exists in terms of data aggregation and translation and visualization for repurposing that exists just within one building, one institution. We are talking now about smart heritage, right? Like in general in the city, but there is so much to do yet just in one smart museum to allow this data to reach wider audiences in a more kind of, uh, you know, meaningful way. So it can start, uh, you know, create new stories for audiences for museum curators and for uh, city makers. So thank you. That's a really great talk that you shared today. So, and right now, uh, let me invite Michael Rigby to the floor, who is data science support team lead at the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network. I must share that Michael and his team has been really helpful in designing Melbourne Engagement Power Layer of the Australian Center for the Moon Image Soft Power Mapping application, and Aurin supported the projects through data access and focus consultations on various uh, levels. And the result was the application functionality to accurately map uh, where museum visitors live and link this information to important demographic and cultural diversity data. Michael 
Will is a, a special scientist with a background in design and engineering and is engaged right now in a range of collaborative research infrastructure projects across Australia from health and green and open spaces to urban sensing using new technology. So Michael, uh, this is your turn right now. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, it's a very kind introduction. And um, what I'll do today is just present um, a very high level meta view almost of, of what Oren is and what, what we do in the data science support team. Um, so, so hello everybody, uh, my name is Michael from Oren, which stands for the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network, which is a wholly digital infrastructure project um, in Australia that's enabled what we call the, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Um, and I'm based here at the University of Melbourne. Um, so at a really high level, uh, Oren's mission as a national research infrastructure is to provide world-class, is to support re world-class research that will really drive greater innovation in Australia's human settlements, um, help to benefit Australia's economy, the environment, social well-being, and really to enable Australia's researchers to address key national and global challenges associated with the urban regional planning um, and all the rest of it. We're talking here about climate change, population growth, and a bunch of other really large challenges. And our role as a research infrastructure is to really help and drive these researchers forward. Um, now, Oren works alongside a range of other really important research infrastructures, um, such as those look at telescopes up into the sky, microscopes that look at cells through to the natural environment, um, like geosciences and the actual oceans. And we sort of work together um, in partnership to really look at some of the, the complex interrelationships across these different spaces to really help researchers. Um, so at Oren, I manage the um, data science support team, um, which supports and really seeks to uplift um, the data science capabilities of researchers um, from really various domains um, and helping them to investigate phenomena and challenges across the built environment understanding uh, it's really inherent interconnectedness um, with the natural environment as well, like I mentioned. And here the team really, really strives to help researchers to understand, um, connect to and, and use a, a range of different capabilities um, to provide them with different things um, in the data world um, that may be real time, time series or historical data. Um, an ex example projects in this space, um, which we're contributing to range from digital twins in Australian local government areas to unlocking archived longitudinal surveys uh, from 20 or 30 years ago um, from the social sciences and bring them back into a spatial context to start them, you know, being used in new ways. Um, I guess as an example from the slide here, if we look to the transport domain, um, this work may include pulling data in from uh, real-time traffic sensors, the actual underlying physical transportation network, um, all the way through to the physical um, environment, such as air quality, particulate matter, um, 3D building models, vegetation canopy cover, as well as the important social layers, such as social demographics and economics, like Natalia mentioned for her project, but also social media, and participatory GIS applications, which got mentioned in the earlier talks as well. And really, in addition to providing access to this federated data catalog at Oren, we really help researchers to build and use analytics models and visualization tools to help them explore the complexity of their research problem space. Um, and this you know, can range from investigating the correlations between variables in a particular um, area, all the potential potential interrelationships between things, all the way through to communicating insights to help to make decisions. Um, so by adopting what, I guess, other parts of the world call a cyber infrastructure, Oren operates um, really as part of a large ecosystem, one that is inherently interconnected with everything else. Um, uh, other, si uh, other systems or subsystems, cyber physical systems, if you like, um, with a range of direct and complex feedback loops, really at different scales. Now, this can sound a bit technical, but really what we're looking at here is the feedback loops which come out of research, the feedback loops which come into research and the importance of that and how we as a re research infrastructure help facilitate that interaction. And one driver that is really occurring across several domains it, um, is the concept of digital twinning. Um, which really with, within a research infrastructure perspective, we see is some of 
sort of helping us be the engine to really drive things. And a research infrastructure can feed back into this. Um, and here we can look at outputs generated from research, whether it's the development of new indicators through to analytics models and visualizations and documentation as well to provide fee valuable feedback for others to draw upon so that we can ultimately build something which can you know, be that thing um, that others can build upon, whether you want to use this analogy so we can build upon the shoulders of giants. So in terms of some reflections um, today, um, really wanted to look at, I guess, a number of different things, which we can, I guess, unpack in the discussion. Um, really, I think it's important to note the concept of value can be measured in so many different ways, um, from creating measurable impacts uh, through to maintaining a sustainable platform or infrastructure into the future. Um, and here, I guess, we can look at concepts such as fair data and fair research software. Um, and how these important components that we build things correctly in terms of make things findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, we can really um, power, I guess, and drive uh, this space and really try and leverage some of the work going on at the UN and the open science community to really push things forward. And the last thing I wanted to comment here um, is that the importance of really data and software relationship specialists to really help connect things together um, and really governance frameworks as well so that we can really structure how things are available online so that we really have research interests and public good at heart um, and really the efforts of some really great people and organizations at the moment to really try and unlock value across the whole data landscape and tool landscape is critical to ensure that researchers really have access to what they need to do research. So thank you very much. Um, it's my little short presentation and I look forward to the discussion later. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of such uh, networks as you develop this our network that exists as a part of the University of Melbourne that really makes data not only accessible, but provide all important information about the data so we can trust the data to do our mapping project, to do all the data-related data-intensive projects around our cities. And I, I would imagine that has a real uh, great value for the city governance. So uh, uh, thank you all for all great contributions to the panel. And let me now challenge you with uh, some questions. So uh, each of your talks on the panel were really instrumental to reveal the involvement of various stakeholders in building data infrastructures in contemporary smart cities, from governments and heritage institutions to research academic networks. And expanding beyond the confines of each of these stakeholders' senses of data ownership, do you think that urban data uh, possesses its own agency, both empowering and responding to specific forms of urban governance, and also maybe offering a structure to different uh, ways of collaboration and cooperation. And in what relationships your own institutions are with this agency of urban data, and what role do you believe your data activities play or potentially could play in constructing a data image of the city? So uh, whoever wants to go first, you're very welcome. Um, I can Steve? start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just quickly. Um, so we're part of, or we're involved in an area called the Culture Mile, which is, I think, it's a mile diameter circle um, around Barbican in the centre of London. And um, what the the point that you've raised there about our relationship with urban data is is um, going to be really really important. Um, I guess one of the things for us is that for us to you know, share our data and to make use of that data, um, there needs to be some sort of understanding about the structure of that data. And there has to be agreement on how we're going to collect and prepare that data. And, um, and honestly, we're just in the very early stages of that um, for the culture mile. So it's a really exciting play, uh, time for, for London and for us to address that issue specifically. Okay, thank you so much, Steve, for to share with us this exciting developments that's still in progress. And uh, uh, David, would you like to take your turn right, right now? Yeah, uh, I think uh, urban data uh, does have its own agency. Um, maybe the data itself isn't they uh, doesn't have the agency, but it's that knowledge or the information um, or the value 
embedded in that data. So the ones and the zeros um, of the data is, is a bit, it's, uh, so it's by itself, but it's what you do with it, who um, who can access it and who can utilize that data. I think, I think with Smart Heritage, it can be um, used in any way. Um, and if that data is highly accessible through platforms and sources that everybody can reach, uh, then one could definitely argue that it's got its own data, it takes on its um, life of its own. Okay, thank you, David. Michael, <laughs> some words from you to uh, conclude the panel. Yeah, thank you. And I guess those last comments from David are really important. Because um, I guess, like I said in my presentation, it's really, I guess, as a research infrastructure and uh, this community almost, uh, these really important feedback loops, whether it's the data itself, or the decisions or the insights is, is really valuable. Um, the more we understand the data and its impl implications broader across the city, we can we can look to how, I guess, we can um, manage the data and also um, push it out, look at things like governance frameworks and all the rest of it. And um, I guess some of the examples from our side of things, we have researchers coming to us who work with, we help them publish new indicators, understanding more the complexity of society and those indicators get push out to policymakers. And those policymakers come up with fantastic new policies which lead through the government cycle and really push out um, whether we're looking at heat health vulnerability, particular part of the city which are more vulnerable to uh, heat waves all the way through to those parts of the city um, which may need improvements in transport or opportunities for new transport services or initiatives, particularly in active transport, I think that whole pipeline is, is so important and just really understanding all the, the interactions across that and the feedback loops, I think I would stress. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. And thank you once again to all the panelists who exposed the a real value of data in the smart urban environments. Unfortunately, it's time to stop it right now in the yeah, 20 minutes late uh, behind our schedule, unfortunately, but uh, stay with us. And uh, yes, let me now move to the next panel and invite Laura to the floor who facilitated this very amazing discussion among more uh, four museum professionals uh, about specific uh, uh, project that they conducted within the frameworks of the museums that are related to digital placemaking. So Laura, the floor is yours right now. Thank you very much, Natalia, and hello, everyone. My name is Laura Popovicu. I'm an art historian and a curator at the UK Government Art Collection, and I've been helping Natalia with this uh, project. And I'm delighted to um, introduce uh, and facilitate the last uh, section of our webinar today, and we'll be hearing from four panelists. Um, as uh, before, uh, our panelists will be giving five minutes presentations and at the end, I will be asking some questions. So let's start with the first panelist who is Etta Grotrian. She's the digital strategy manager at Uberse Museum in Bremen. And prior to that, she was um, at the digital and publishing department at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. She has developed digital concepts for cultural institutions and historical political education pro projects. Welcome, Etta. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, very short introduction. The city of Bremen has a history of merchants and international trade, which has been already set ground to in the medieval ages. It's in the north of Germany, as you can see on the map. And of course, this history also meant that the early beginnings of imperialistic or colonial exploitation has been part of the city's history too. And um, the formal colonial history or the, the, the formal um, power of colonial history might be considered as a short one in Germany compared to other European states, but the prehistory of this was the involvement of merchants and private entrepreneurs in exploitation and suppression of people. And what you can see on my screen is Bremen's colonial monument. It has been established in the 1930s to cheer these entrepreneurs and the National Socialist attempt to re-establish a German colonial em empire. But now officially it has been turned into a monument or a memorial site of genocide and war 
and remembering the heritage of the colonial past. And the Übersee Museum, and Übersee means overseas museum, has a tradition of over 120 years of collaboration with these merchants and these entrepreneurs to collect objects from all over the world with a scientific aim. And we as a museum, we need to face this origin of our collections as the city faces its colonial past and responsibility. And the museum has an important role in this process. We need to engage with communities and people in the countries where our objects come from. We need to learn about these often destroyed connections between people and the heritage. And also we need to make these connections visible for our visitors and to a worldwide audience that we find online. And uh, the digital transformation plays of course an important role in this process. At the heart of our digital strategy, is the need to share our collections, to connect knowledge and to build open networks. And as a digital transformation process is also a learning process that changes the way that the organization is constructed and it changes the way we, we, we do things or things can be done. And it's, it's of course also a process of communication, a lot of communication and the communication inside the organization is key to the communication outside the organization. So our experience of taking a step back, learning and listening and reflecting on our experience is an important step in this process of transformation. And that is the background of our digital um, um, activities. And I want to show you a very short example, we try to reinvent and rethink the role of our museum as a place for impact and conversation. And one of our projects is called the Neo Collections Project. It is a cooperation project. And in this project, we learn how to connect the collections in Bremen to people to in, in, in the international range and to learn to switch perspectives. We started a dialogue and invited people that we were curious about as critical friends to share with us their very personal experiences, for example, in podcasting, in curating an exhibition with the neighborhood or, in, or as a translator. And these were very personal talks with a small group of colleagues where we also learned to share our insecurities in asking questions, very personal, being unprepared in these conversations. And you can read about this experience in our blog. But based on these conversations, we took a next step. We reached out to creative practitioners with a link to the Pacific Islands or to the diaspora communities as digital residents in our museum, but only with digital communication and started to think about prototypes together to connect these three of our questions that came up in these conversations in the small groups to think about proto developing prototypes to connect different approaches to these questions with our visitors. So to sum up, we are still in this process and we right now we develop both ways to, to bring these experiences to our visitors, but also to connect audiences in Bremen with people in the Pacific as a next step. And also we ask ourselves, how do this in our, co in our corporations, how this this, uh, does this reflect in our exhibitions as well? And one other step that we started in our cooperation with the National University of Samoa is starting a Facebook channel and connecting and publishing our collections data and publishing it and starting a dialogue about different perspectives uh, with people in Samoa, different perspectives on our collections. This channel is very new and it is called Oceania Collection Voyages. So you could find our process of um, dialogue about our collections there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Etta. And I think it's really important to understand how um, a museum can act as a mediator between the past and the present, and also to 
to understand that and acknowledge that this is a learning process and that you know it's important that you, you we we do it collectively and involve um lots of people in in this process um so our next panelist is megan lawrence she's the head of digital at the australia museum a role that leads design and development of digital experiences inspired by the museum's natural science and cultural collections please megan I'm sorry we lost that pre previous presentation. It looked really fantastic. Um, but it's great to join you today and many thanks to the other participants for their insightful presentations. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from Gadigal country and pay respect to First Nation elders past and present. The Australian Museum was established in Sydney in 1827. So we've got over 190 years um, of, you know, being at the forefront of Australian natural history collection and research. Today, the Australian Museum continues its work with the wonderful mission to ignite wonder, inspire debate and drive change. We aim to be a leading voice for the richness of life, the earth and culture in Australia and the Pacific. And we're committed to transforming the conversation around climate change, the environment and wildlife conservation, as well as be a strong advocate for First Nations culture and continue to develop world leading science collections, exhibitions and education programs. I've included some high level stats on your screen. I'm not sure if you can see it very well um, around our research and engagement with audiences and including the digital visitation, which I'm really proud with our website reaching more than 6.8 million sessions annually. So we've got a very engaged audience in our site and we keep working on that over time. Um, I'll keep moving. Uh, I started my role at the AM in 2018, uh, 2016, sorry, and have led the redevelopment of our flagship website, which was a massive task with over 10,000 web pages to migrate into a new CMS, and as well as presenting the opportunity to rethink the pathways to content. During a discovery phase, we mapped the AM's digital ecosystem to better understand our audiences and their jobs to be done in the digital visitation to the site. We identified four behavioural archetypes. We've got planners, knowledge seekers, connectors and participators, as well as several user experience design principles that we've since embedded in our digital product development and online content strategy. So what did we do in response to the pandemic lockdowns in Australia? Um, from March in 2020, the governments across Australia started in, to issue stay, extended stay at home orders in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This initiated a whole new level of digital engagement with our audiences as parents started homeschooling their children, as well as much of the population being restricted to working online. Our CEO, Kim McKay, asked the digital team to create AM Inside Out, a curated landing page of materials as a digital place for people to browse and learn from remotely. You can see the many content highlights there from photogrammetry to online jigsaws about strange specimens we have in our collections. Uh, activities for students at home, staff reading lists, as well as curated stories about our science expeditions and research that was still taking place. We also had to pivot our online, uh, sorry, our on-site science festival to be completely online. The Sydney Science Trail um, brings together science professionals and educators to raise the profile of science by delivering a variety of activities to inspire younger generations and increase scientific understanding and appreciation. So our digital visitors had to participate in a diverse program of free activities, games, digital exhibitions, live stream talks and demonstrations from scientists, researchers and curators. The Sydney Science Trail recorded a really long average engagement metric. I was really putting that down to the fact that we also developed a simple quiz to play as you explored the online activities. Each question and answer was related to a hotspot of the content um, within the trail and so it encouraged ongoing engagement with the material. So it was a really great example of how gameplay embedded in a learning experience can help maintain engagement. Finally, the project that I'm probably most proud of was the development of digital twins of some of our exhibitions, particularly of Unsettled, which aimed to preserve the works, curation and intrinsic story of the exhibition for prosperity. Unsettled was a temporary exhibition which amplified First Nations voice and promoted truth telling about Australia's foundational history and the ongoing legacy of colonisation. 
In this powerful exhibition, First Nation voices reveal the hidden stories of devastation, survival, and the fight for recognition. More than a Matterport virtual tour, we developed the digital twin um, with, with additional layers of content, which enabled extension of the exhibition online with sound, embedded video, extra information, and interactive 3D photogrammetry, allowing a new and unique experience to emerge. Unsettled illuminates the power of truth-telling to realise change. And as a digital twin experience, you know, we, we have amplified access to the understanding of our shared past as an important step towards healing for a shared future. I really hope you take time to review this work in particular, and I'll post a link to the video about the creation of this place-based digital experience in the chat for you to look at later. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Megan. And it's really fascinating to see how creatively you've navigated around the difficulties of lockdown and the, the potential of the digital. Thank you. Okay, and our last speaker for today is Dr. Janet Owen, who is the founder and executive director of the Earth Museum, a not-for-profit initiative inspired by 30 years working in the museum and cultural heritage environment. Um, Janet, please, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you very much, uh, Laura and Natalia, for inviting us uh, to speak um, briefly today. And um, the, the Earth Museum's uh, a brief contribution is, is really going to just introduce the Earth Museum, but within the context of thinking about the, the systems within which, which we, we, we work and operate. And it's been brilliant to hear everybody's contribution today, which is um, wonderful to see so, so much variety. Um, so I've, I've entitled my short uh, contribution, Whose Data and Whose Power? And um, just something very, um, uh, just show you a, a couple of very uh, simple uh, diagrams where we're just trying to um, explore that uh, a little bit further. And one of the things that I'm very interested in is how cultural institutions holds um, hold collections data in a, in, in a complex power system. Um, and many of those collections are driven um, uh, from their origins in terms of historical imperialism and centralism and so on, which has a lot of contemporary resonance and legacies, as we know. Um, and it takes a kind of journey through institutional ownership and professional uh, gatekeeping to um, uh, an increasing interest in community engagement, curation, ownership and empowerment. And it's been really great today to hear some really exciting sort of projects around that. And I think where I, uh, I'm particularly interested in um, exploring um, uh, and, and reflecting is how digital and data can really help to disrupt um, uh, some of those perhaps more, more um, uh, his, historical power systems, but within which we, we, we still operate. And uh, one of my slides uh, related back, uh, which I took out related back to um, to the film The Matrix with the blue pill and the red pill and just that sort of every now and again stepping away from the systems within which we're working to reflect on the sort of uh, complexity of that. And um, I'm interested in how we can maybe sort of really place centrally the empowerment and the community ownership and community engagement so that really what museums and other organizations and institutions become is very much around professional facilitation and institutional stewardship rather than ownership. So those legacies and histories are still very much there, but the empowerment and the community ownership and the community narratives um, drive things forward. And I think that's a really um, a powerful opportunity that digital and data uh, provide for digital placemaking and heritage uh, go going forward. So, so the Earth Museum is, is, is very much a uh, small um, experiment in this area and um, just really kind of seeks to scratch the surface in terms of thinking about these things in, in different ways. Uh, we're, we're a not-for-profit, we're, we're virtually based, we have no physical museum presence, we have no collection, um, but we work with collections that and heritage stories that exist in public and private spheres and, and, and so on. And we're very much about working with um, the learning and generally curious in terms of our uh, the audiences that we engage with. I'm very much interested in deep mapping the fine grain and sense of place, which, which really is where we find the meaning and relevance um, uh, uh, really sort of um, shines through in terms of storytelling. 
and the tangible and intangible cultural and natural heritage data atoms as we call them that almost kind of now with 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 digital and data can sort of escape their buildings can escape their the physicality of the, the themselves and sort of mix and fuse in lots of different ways through creative storytelling um, both locally and both hyper locally but also globally the, the sort of global connections between places is really really interesting so one of the reasons why we call ourselves the Earth Museum is, is because we go where the stories take us when we're, we're not sort of rooted in a particular subject or a particular geography or, 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 or whatever. But right at the heart of this, and I suppose this is my sort of particular plea, is we're really interested in advocating open accessible data so that at the heart of that, that can really support that empowerment, community curation, community um, uh, engagement participation agenda so it's not about us in the nicest possible way and I've, I'm as much involved in this as anybody else of, of saying here's a bit of money we've got now we'll, we'll sort of make these collections accessible and we'll work with these areas of community it's about communities being able to come and work with our collections and I've just got a, a, a couple of examples of that we work with um, member organisations, we work with open data sources, and we also work with overlays into existing wonderful collections online resources by individual organisations. One example of a project we did um, uh, during uh, COVID was with the Rapa Nui Pioneers Society, which is based on Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and we work with them to look at and explore artifacts from across the world uh, or ac across the world in museum collections that have been taken uh, from from um, uh, Rapa Nui Easter Island in the 19th century in particular and re digitally relocate those to, 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 to places and stories on the island and the whole process of finding and identifying and tracking those artifacts down was a really really interesting experience for us all. The second example I'm just going to briefly show you is a project that again has is about um, indigenous collections that connect with many different places in the world that were brought together um, as, a, as a, a colonial imperialist collection by the surgeons who served on British Royal Navy ships um, uh, uh, from, from a place called Portsmouth on, on the south coast and they gave their collections to a museum in a place called Hasler which has a local primary and secondary school uh, next to it and we worked with the students in the primary and secondary school in Hasler in Gosport to just start to reveal some of their local globally connected stories to start to sort of uh, reflect on as part of UN sustainable development goals and so on. So the way we did this because the collections are now at the British Museum and the Natural History Museum is we developed an overlay that helped these students access British Museum collections online and then create their own. The, 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 the image at the bottom here is a, a, a GPS based uh, map that they created themselves. They selected the artifacts that they wanted to, uh, to, to place on and they did all of that sort of creation and through that we were looking at responsible consumerism, we were looking at climate action, we were looking at global connections uh, from, a, from a local place. So just very specific example. And then I'm going to stop here and just say there are, there are many more examples of little projects that we've been doing um, uh, over the last um, two and a half years or, or just since uh, June 2019 that you can find on our website at theearthmuseum.co.uk uh, and um, the, they include a world of treasures and a world of stories where we, as we build individual maps with individual projects, we add content onto a sort of collective, collective whole. But thank you very much for giving us the space to just share this briefly with you. Thank you very much, Janet. And it was really interesting to hear more about your approach to making global connections through participation. I think we have uh, time for one uh, question which I'd like to ask all our panelists, which is to elaborate on the impact of their projects on audience engagement, whether that's local or international. Um, and so, Etta, perhaps you could tell us more about your engagement with the Critical Friends for the Neo-Colonial um, Neo-Collection uh, project and also the impact of the project um, it, on your um, local audiences. Yes, of course, I would like to do that. 
Um, as I, as I um, stated, the critical friends were the first step in an internal learning process, which is the basis for our process to connect to international networks and, and reflect that to our visitors. So what, I, what was important to me is that we, have a, that we have a conversation and a communication process internally in the organization and then reach out to the, to the visitors in Bremen, to the people in Bremen, and also to international networks and try to find audiences in a, in a global audience community. And this is something that is really new um, to the museum, to the city as well. Um, and it is also, and this is about, I think, about the impact in bringing this experience and bringing this dialogue and bringing this perspective, for example, of people in Samoa on our collections and the experiences with our collections that are very different from a visitor in Bremen, but to bring this experience back in our exhibitions and to, to connect um, an audience in Bremen with these perspectives um, from people in the countries where our objects come from. And this is, I think, for me, um, a great challenge where the, where the digital connections might help us on the one hand, but on the other hand, other than reaching out to our audiences um, via the internet, we need to be aware that the internet is not a global experience that is everywhere the same experience. So this is, there's a lot of challenges in doing that, but I think it's worth it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Etta. And Megan, do you have um, an indication of what resonance uh, your projects have had on, on the audiences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with the Unsettled exhibition, it had opened just for one month before we went into a lockdown. So by doing the sort of virtual capture of that exhibition, it really enabled us to amplify those First Nation voices to tell their own stories, their own histories. And using the museum as a platform for that, I think, is really important because, um, you know, often it, it's a narrative that hasn't been shared. And it was so wonderful to work with the curators to do that kind of capture and, and you know, it was such an incredible exhibition. And now it lives on as well. I think that's probably the most important part of it too. Thank you very much, Megan. And Janet, uh, the, the Earth Museum addresses a global audience. So have you been able to capture um, the way in which um, your projects have been uh, received by audiences or specific audiences, perhaps? Yeah, so so um, we do uh, quite a, uh, so our projects are, are, spe are quite specific, although then they're, they're, they're shared in a, in a, in a sort of, um, global context with, with as, as Etta says, that sort of proviso that the digital experience globally is, 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 is um, hugely variable um, and locally as well. Um, but the, um, uh, the, the couple of examples I'll very quickly give you in terms of, we do quite a lot of evaluation work on our specific projects working with schools. And one of the things we're particularly interested in, in is the, the theme around empathy and global citizenship and how through um, uh, exploring some of these, um, uh, these, these stories, we can uh, explore both um, the sort of geography and history aspects of the curriculum and some of the science aspects, but also very importantly, the citizenship aspects of, of, of curriculum. Um, and so that's a, that's a piece of work that we do a lot of on and we um, you know, can, can see some of the results coming through the, through the work that, that we, we've been doing. The other thing I'll just briefly mention is the work with the Rapa Nui Pioneer Society, which was um, uh, one of the real kind of learning points and evaluation for, for, for us as a, as a connected and collective team uh, was very much how um, the, the, and maybe it came as less of a surprise for, for, for me, having worked in, in, in museums for many years, but for Christian, for example, um, sort of coming in from a very different perspective, how the, the knowledge of that, how things came from, how they were taken, kind of got lost in the museological processes that then followed. Um, and how actually this kind of conversation and dialogue can really help to bring that back and, and really kind of bring it present again. And, I, and, and we came out from this project with a, an action which we haven't yet sort of developed, which is around, there's something here about curation and uh, facilitating thinking about curation and cataloging in a, in a different way. And I think 
Um, certainly, I've, you know, Etta's sort of touched on it, and, and, and I suspect that there are many other projects where that kind of thing, you know, really resonates through. But, but there's something really meaningful there, I think, about the, 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 the loss and gap of knowledge that actually, you know, can, can bring meanings back really fruitfully for everybody concerned in, in the collective process. Thank you very much, Janet, and thank you all for your wonderful uh, presentations. And Katie, we look forward to your recording later. <laughs> and um, I'll now hand hand back to Natalia. Thank you. Uh, what a fascinating concluding panel. I'm really excited to see what so many great museum initiatives happening in the digital domain that really help for citizens on site and virtual visitors to connect to museums and explore open cultural heritage in different locations. So I would like to thank everybody now in their really great contribution to our discussion today in Urban Digital Soft Power, a topic that I believe that hasn't been discussed extensively and meaningfully yet or, um, in academia or, or among professionals, especially in relation to heritage and glam sector. And I hope you enjoyed the webinar as much as I did. And I wanted to invite you all to join our datathon happening this Wednesday, June 1st, where we will explore how urban cultural infrastructure data could inform decision-making process in glam international endeavors and programs. So thank you very much and come back very soon. Bye-bye to everyone everybody.